I have recounted, in a small way, William Manchester's part in the horror that was the battle on Okinawa. He was nearly blown apart, as others near him were, by a rocket mortar that filled his back with shrapnel, somehow not tearing into his vital organs or severing his spinal cord, still setting off metal detectors in airports until his death in 2004. Bad as that was, how could he know that one day he would find himself in a situation almost as terrible, facing, instead of ferociously manned Japanese fortifications, the Kennedy family? When he returned from the war and recovered from his injuries, which took three years and five operations, Manchester worked with several jobs as a newspaper reporter, took an advanced course in skepticism from H.L. Mencken, and then he began to write books, fictional novels, and historical accounts, most notably the historical non-fiction reporting. Research and storytelling were his forte, details and anecdotes his tools. He wrote a short book about the president, John Kennedy, and he was selected by Kennedy's widow to write the authorized, by her, version of the events leading up to and following the assassination on November 22, 1963. For several reasons, I think, he found this to be an offer he could not refuse. He took it on, and in a little under three years, <coughs> produced a 1,200-page manuscript. While he was doing this, anxious to avoid contention, he produced and signed a Memorandum of Understanding, chiefly with Robert Kennedy, who was acting on behalf of the Kennedy family, meaning mainly Jackie. Manchester, foolishly, as it turned out, believed that was a final blessing and would clear the way to the book's eventual publication. Jackie didn't read the manuscript. Bobby didn't either. They had plenty of surrogates reading it for them. Editors, agents, friends, secretaries. These people didn't care if the facts were right or the history was intact. If they didn't want it in, it was out or it was changed. There were any number of things they might object to. Things that might offend her personally. Things that might not fit into her image of the political legacy of her husband, whom she referred to only as President Kennedy. Nothing was going to tarnish her view of the past, certainly not meticulous research or accurate reporting. Jackie had once famously led the nation on a fastidious television tour of the White House. This book would be her equally elegant tour of the history, no matter who wrote it. For whatever reason, somehow Manchester didn't see that coming. Also, thickening the plot, Bobby Kennedy had his political future to consider. And then there was the looming president of the sitting looming presence of the sitting president, Lyndon Johnson, whose relations with the Kennedys had always been awkward at best. Those threads were tied into the history, affecting what could be written and what could not. I lost count of the number of people who were reading the manuscript, changing words, striking out passages, adding new ones. It was a writer's nightmare, a literary crucifixion. There was a meeting at the Kennedy compound, a powwow with Jackie. First she went water skiing, which of course she did surpassingly well. Then she and Manchester swam from the boat to shore. She had flippers and left him far behind. He thought about drowning and wondered, if I did drown, would that be good for the book or bad for the book? On shore, in discussion about the book, Jackie would fret, burst into tears, and run into her house, return, and do it again. At the close of the day, she said, revealing her secure knowledge of her place in the history, anybody who is against me will look like a rat unless I run off with Eddie Fisher. Manchester liked on occasion to toss a flagrantly big word into his mix, like elemocenary. He used the word tergiversator to describe Lyndon Johnson. It means evasiveness, equivocation, running a broken field. Soon everyone connected to this project began tergiversating furiously. The book became a living testament to the art of tergiversation. It was too much for Manchester. 
He was hospitalized twice, once for nervous exhaustion, the other time for pneumonia. The Washington rumor mill, churning wildly, thought he was dead. He fled to England and the Caribbean, a vacation place in Maine, but he could not escape. He tried to hide out in New York City under several pseudonyms, but he was recognized from TV interviews, so he ran into a drugstore and bought a pair of sunglasses, failing to notice that the rims were beaded with rhinestones, and when he left the store out on the sidewalk, he was, he wrote, immediately accosted by a homosexual. Hiding out in a hotel, working on rewrites, he heard a knock on the door and a cry, Bill, are you in there? There was a pounding on the door and, Bill, Bill, I know you're in there. It was Bobby Kennedy, the Attorney General of the United States. Manchester refused to see him. Magazine serialization further complicated the drama. Jackie Kennedy, still living in Camelot and still not having read the book, sued, and Manchester became the rat. She accused him of disregarding propriety and good faith, of violating the dignity and privacy of me and my children, of writing a premature account that is both tasteless and distorted, filled with inaccurate and unfair references to other individuals. She was shocked at his failure to keep his word. Eventually, the suit was withdrawn or settled, and the book was published. It became a bestseller. The Kennedy Library made at least a million dollars off its sales. Bobby Kennedy, running for president after Johnson dropped out, was shot to death. And Jackie said nice things about everyone before she went and married, well, it wasn't Eddie Fisher. And Manchester, writer of history, had a little lesson in how it is made.